Here we are once again. Welcome back. This is task C of the Fundamentals of Instruction, CFI PTS. Uh, task C is concerned with the teaching process. Now, before we begin, I'd like to tell a little story. Um, I had an instructor, my who's my private pilot instructor, pretty dry guy, and uh, smoked a lot. So our lessons were constantly interrupted by smoke breaks, and uh, it was just really distracting. Now, if he wants to smoke, that's fine, but you know, I was paying for these lessons, and so every time that he took a smoke break, uh, I was paying for that cigarette. So that didn't sit too well with me. Um, and I, you know, I never confronted him about it because he was my instructor and all, but you know, it was, uh, just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. If you catch the pun there. Anyways, that's beside the point, but, um, we are going to jump right into teaching processes here. Let me get a handy dandy pen. And here is our title, Teaching Process. There it is. All right, what are we gonna look at? Here's an outline. We're gonna look at prep. You have to prepare for a lesson. You can't just jump into it, unless you've been doing it a really long time and you really know your material, but you must prepare, okay? You have to organize yourself, resources, materials, locations, environment, uh, notes, all that kind of stuff. Delivery, there's different delivery methods. We're gonna talk about different delivery methods for instructing. Finally, we're going to sum it up with uh, some problem-based learning. Talk about different ways to engage your students problem-based learning, All right? Very good. So, talk about it. Preparation. Um, I was in the military, and many people um, have been in the military, and those who have will quickly recognize the following. Task, condition, Standard. That's not good. Every lesson, are you kidding me? Every lesson should begin with the task, the condition, and the standard. Students need to know what is expected of them. They need to know what they're going to learn and how they're going to do it. So, um, a, a purely academic discussion. Uh, the task might be to learn uh, such and such, you know, the following conditions would be classroom environment. Um, standard would be pass a quiz. All right. Something more hands on, something a more uh, psychomotor skill, such as. Uh, power off stall, the task might be to successfully um, execute a power off stall. The conditions would be daytime, VFR, uh, single engine airplane uh, with instructor on board. Standard is to successfully co complete the power off stall uh, in tolerances as outlined in the private pilot PTS. Okay, so every lesson should start um, with this task condition standard. It gives the student uh, where we're at, where we're going, how we're gonna get there, and what does success look like. They have to know what success looks like, okay? So, after we've done that, we jump into our lesson. Talk about organization. We want to give a brief introduction, okay? Um, kind of going along with the task, and it's not always, or it's not always a bad idea to start with a story or a joke or something, something to get their attention. If you'll notice, I gave you a little story about my own experience with my smoking instructor. 
Now, it had served no purpose um, in teaching you anything, but it broke the ice and it just kind of got uh, the lesson started, I guess you would say. You want to provide motivation. Why is this important to them? Okay, I'm going to jot that down. We want to tell them why uh, this lesson is important. Hey, a power off stall. This is important to know because if you get too slow, this is what happens, right? Uh, we want to give them an overview. Tell them what's going to be covered during the lesson and give them the big picture, right? Uh, nobody likes to walk into the unknown and not know where this discussion is going. So let them know what the lesson is going to be about. While we're organizing, we need to develop in a logical order. So we want to go from past to present. We want to go from the simple to the complex. And finally, from known to unknown. Okay. Uh, the most frequently used items to the least frequently. We want to introduce, show how that least frequently used concept ties in and is associated with the most frequently used concept. Uh, a good example of this, like past to present, is when talking about GPS navigation. So let's talk about uh, magnetic north and true north and uh, VORs a little bit maybe and where we were at, you know, even 20 years ago and where we're at today. Uh, simple to the complex, same kind of thing. You know, start with the magnetic north discussion and then move into the VORs uh, navigation. That's more complex than just choosing a heading and flying it. And obviously known to the unknown. If they already know about something that's related, show them how it's, uh, it ties all in and it'll make the learning much easier. And finally, we need to give a conclusion. Wrap it all up, tie it all together, and show them uh, how this lesson progressed from something we didn't know into something we now know now, and how we're going to incorporate this lesson into our flying lives. All right. Next discussion. We are going to talk about the delivery method. Spend a little bit of time on this because uh, there's different ideas here that are worthy of, of uh, discussing a little more in depth. First method, lecture, all right? We all know what a lecture is. It's your professor standing in front of the class um, preaching. It's a one-way discussion, right? We can have a straight lecture where it's simply one person doing all the talking, the students are silent and there's no participation. Or we can have a teaching lecture um, that allows for more participation by the students. Maybe they're broken up into small groups and each presents a small different uh, concept or something along those lines. While we're lecturing, we want to avoid complex words or terms that uh, they have to think about. If we're talking about uh, some acronym that they have no idea what it means, they're going to miss the next five minutes of your discussion, of your lecture, and they're going to be thinking about what the heck does that mean again? They're going to be looking it up or writing down notes or asking a friend or something like that. So avoid complex words or terms. If you have to use them, explain them. Say, I'm going to use this term. This is a new concept. This is what it means. It's okay for a lecture to read from a manuscript or use an outline. In fact, if you don't know what you're talking about, you should be using an outline um, or some kind of manuscript. It helps you to not forget important parts, um, and it helps you to emphasize parts that are very important that shouldn't be glossed over. Um, lectures work really well for large groups. Uh, it's a great way to get a massive amount of information to a massive amount of people or uh, a smaller group, but you know what I mean. Um, it's when we know, when we need to get a lot of information out, the lecture is the way to go. 
The downside is that people quickly become bored um, and they can tune you out. So be aware of short attention spans. Uh, you need to break it up with something. If you're using PowerPoint, for instance, uh, throw in some funny pictures. Do something that keeps them engaged and keeps them um, tracking with you. Next type of delivery method is the guided discussion. This is pretty obvious. It can be a group participation, like I said earlier, uh, breaking them up into small groups, each discussing a, a different concept. But the downside is that students need some kind of education on the concept uh, before this is used. Otherwise, they just sit there and they have no idea what you're talking about. The goal of the guided discussion is to draw out participation um, from the students. Why is that important? Well, it allows us to see what the students know. It's like a, a feeler gauge um, as to the students' level of understanding. And it helps us as an instructor to um, tailor our courses in the future if we need to uh, dumb them down or if we can progress more rapidly. So they're great for that. Um, for that idea. The greater their participation, um, the better the understanding of the students. The more that they are teaching it, the more they are realizing what they do and don't know. Um, it's important to not let the discussions get sidetracked, though. The instructor needs to use questions. I'm going to write that down here. Keep the discussion on track, all right? And how can you do that? Asking questions. So if you feel that it's maybe getting off topic a little bit, ask a question that brings it back. Um, you want to make sure you get all the material out and uh, that the students uh, gain, gain all the knowledge that they, they need to gain from the discussion. Um, these questions can be several different types. And I'm going to purchase some more real estate right here. The questions can either be uh, like overhead questions. That's where you just throw it out to the entire group. Anybody can answer. Um, whoever might know it, they answer the question. We can have rhetorical questions. What is a rhetorical question? It's a question that the instructor provides the answer to. For example, why do we not want to stall on short final? Well, obviously, if we stall the airplane on short final, we are going to crash into the ground and have a bad day, right? That's a rhetorical question. Next kind is direct. We can ask direct questions. Hey, Tom, what do you think about such and such? Um, we're identifying a student and asking them directly. And finally, we have the relay question. So a student asks us, the instructor, a question, and we think that they might be able to answer it on their, <coughs> excuse me, on their own. So we kind of guide them with a question thrown back at them. Right? We've all seen this used before, and it gives a great sense of accomplishment and uh, self-confidence boosting when the student is able to answer their own question. All right, uh, good. So that sums up the uh, lecture and guided discussion techniques. Uh, one that's not used, it might be used some places, but uh, computer assisted. Get the idea. Maybe through watching the videos, maybe taking quizzes on a computer. Um, these can be good because they're self-paced and students can either move quickly ahead or spend more time on areas that they're having difficulty with. Uh, this instructor can also track progress through uh, how quickly they're moving, through quizzes or uh, tests that are given over the computer. Um, and again, this takes some preparation and some logistics. So 
some places, you know, bigger schools certainly might use it more than a, a smaller uh, one-person show. But don't rule out the computer-aided or computer-assisted uh, delivery method. Next, we have, I'm going to call this demonstration performance method. So this is where the students learn by doing. They observe the skill and then practice it. Uh, great example. Well, any of the, the flying maneuvers are demonstration performance. Uh, the student watches the instructor do a chandel and then they practice it. They watch uh, eights on pylons and then they practice it. Um, and this delivery method has five different phases. First, we have an explanation. Next, we do a demonstration. Next step is student performs. The instructor supervises the performance. And then we evaluate. Evaluation can be done both by the student and by the instructor. Sometimes it's very helpful to have the, the student say uh, or tell the instructor what they did wrong and what uh, they could have done better. The demonstration performance method um, leads right into the next technique, which is drill and practice method. Um, and this is simply repetition leads to learning. Uh, we, the, the tasks that we do repeatedly, we learn. So those are the uh, delivery methods uh, of teaching. Not, uh, there is not any one right way of teaching you need to mix it up and some students will be more receptive um, to techniques than others so keep that in mind that you uh, need to gauge your audience and figure out what is working or, or what is not working okay let's talk about problem-based learning Problem-based learning. This is a student-centered approach, and the book talks about HOTS. I'm going to eventually get rid of this button on this pen because I keep bumping it. Higher order thinking skills. This is where we lead the student through a uh, path to discovery, if you will. Um, we set up the problem. Uh, we, we pitch them this problem and uh, discuss the problem itself. Next, we determine outcomes for the problem, right? What are the different outcomes? They can be good, they can be bad, uh, but just list what are the outcomes? I should probably write this down. Set up the problem. Identify outcomes to the problem. Right? Now, let's solve the problem. Let's choose the best path and solve it. And then we discuss or reflect on the problem solving process. How did we get to where we're at? Right? Next, alternatives. Let's consider alternative. Uh, solutions or additional solutions. Maybe we missed something. Uh, so let's go back and reconsider it. Next, let's reevaluate with those additional um, solutions. Is this better or is it worse than before? So after reevaluate, we're going to consider the outcome. We should put outcomes. And then we're going to define best. What is the best solution? Because the best solution for one scenario might not be the best solution for another scenario. Um, this higher order thinking skill is great for uh, teaching aeronautical decision making, or ADM, as we, we say. 
uh, we set up the scenario, all right? Uh, go, no go. Uh, weather coming in, uh, distance, time, recency, all that stuff that goes into ADM. We consider the outcomes of if we choose to go or if we choose not to go. Then we solve it. Um, is this a good decision? And we t reflect on it, consider the alternatives. What other choices do we have? And then we kind of loop back and we reevaluate and consider the outcomes. And then we ultimately decide what's the best solution, right? So that's a, a real world practical example. Closely tied to this is the good old FAA's SBT, Scenario Based Training. Scenario-based training is just what I was talking about a second ago here. Um, it's not necessarily a test. It uh, is not going to have one right answer. You know, we could have different answers for different skill levels. One person might choose uh, to go in the scenario I, I pitched before. Another person might say, you know what? No, I'm not going to go. So, and neither one is right or wrong. It's uh, uh, dependent upon the person. The answer should not, uh, well, I'm sorry, there is not an obvious answer. Um, it's all subjective. Additionally, the scenario should not promote or encourage errors. We're not trying to trick anybody, okay? I see instructors in all disciplines do that. We're not trying to trick anybody, okay? There's no gotchas, ha-ha, pointing fingers. Um, we're trying to get them to think critically, justify their answers, and think about alternatives. Um, the, finally, the scenario-based training should promote situational awareness and provide opportunities for decision-making. This is really a choose-your-own-adventure. I'm kind of dating myself here, but those choose-your-own-adventure books, those were great. Um, you know, you came to a fork in the road and you had to choose which direction you're going to go. So don't underestimate the use of scenario-based training. It brings meaning to your students and helps them see what exactly, uh, how, how their decisions can affect the outcome. Next, let's talk about collaborative problem solving. Okay, uh, this can be done in group study or an instructor can guide the process as necessary. Um, putting many minds to work to come up with a solution. It's a great technique because, again, everybody has different perceptions, different insights, different experiences, and what one person thinks of, another person may not. So collaborative problem solving is another good technique technique for uh, problem-based learning. Another that can be incorporated into this collaborative problem solving are the use of case studies. The NTSB has files and files of case studies. Uh, these are real-world incidents that more than likely did not have a favorable outcome. So um, giving a group of students uh, a case study um, and talking through the uh, scenario or the incident without giving up the ending, first of all, um, will help them learn. If we tell them, this, this is kind of important, if we tell them that it's an NTSB study, they know it's going to be end in a crash, right, or an incident of some kind. So don't tell them that it's an NTSB crash report. It's going to spoil the whole ending. Okay, and finally, all your lessons should include instruction aids and train some kind of training technology. People learn. But we saw in different in previous tasks that people learn differently. Some have to hear, some have to see, some have to do, 
So the more instructional aids that you can provide, the better chance you have of touching on those different uh, kinesthetic, auditory, visual learning, all those things. Um, but don't let them become distracting, right? Uh, if we put up a picture that could be distracting from uh, a distraction from our actual concept we're talking about, then we've defeated the process. Some types of aids, um, whiteboard, uh, handouts, projector, videos are great, interactive DVDs, uh, computers, models, mock-ups, cutaways. Cutaways are great for uh, mechanics especially. They can see what's going on. But don't forget to use instructional aids and, tr use, and technology. Incorporate technology into your training. That sums up task C. Again, we are using FAA H8083, 9 alpha.